All right. Hi. Hopefully um, you can hear us okay. Um, nice um, nice to see everyone out there. Um, thank you for tuning in. Um, our session is on post-traumatic arthritis, um, broken down into foot and ankle, and we're going to start with ankle and then move into the foot. Um, I'm Bopa Kriya. I will be moderating the session. Um, I'm uh, currently an assistant professor at Oregon Health and Science University and transitioning um, actually uh, very soon to the University of Iowa. Um, and um, I'd like to welcome and thank our other speakers. So uh, Dr. Tyler Gonzalez, he is um, at the University of South Carolina, having done his residency at Harvard and his fellowship at Cedar sinai uh, and Dr. Meg Kelly, she is faculty at Mount Sinai and having done her residency at the University of Rochester and then fellowship at UC Davis. Um, Sarah uh, may not be able to be here, um, but she may tune in a little bit later. She is one of the faculty at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and so thank you everyone for um, being here and we're going to get started. Um, okay, we're going to start, um, our objectives are to go through um, some complex cases on foot and ankle um, post-traumatic arthritis to discuss the treatment options, the indications, and the contraindications. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with case one. Um, this is a case uh, Dr. Gonzalez has presented for us, and I'm going to let him take over in telling us a little bit about it. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me here today and excited uh, to speak with all of you today. So, six year old um, gentleman, he's fairly healthy and active. He had uh, 25 years of ankle pain after an ankle fracture from a motor vehicle accident. His past medical history is pretty unremarkable. On physical exam, he had well healed medial lateral incisions. He had about a 20 degree arc of motion, but he only, he couldn't get to neutral. He had a basically a mechanical block to dorsiflexion. He walked in a fair degree of Aquinas. But, yep. So these are his weight bearing films. You can see severe end stage post. I mean, he has an old medial malleolar screw. Um, he's in slight varus and he has this very large anterior impingement. So. Surprisingly, he had about 20, 25 degrees of plantar flexion, but he couldn't really range past that. So um, he's failed everything, right injections, bracing, very active. And so at this point, we um, pretty good. Oh, before you go, don't, don't give too much away. Yep. Oh, yeah. I'm not. I was oh. going to go to plan. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, good. I ain't rushing. Um, Good, because I wanted to um, uh, ask both of you, what are um, what are your thoughts so far as far as surgical treatment options for th this patient? I think, Dr. Gonzalez, you you mentioned that, you know, non-operative treatments, bracing, shoe modifications, activity changes, injections, all failed. Yes, yeah, that's right. And, I, and I'm pretty aggressive with that stuff and and getting people to you know a lot of people you get better but at some point it's you know especially in people like this who have mechanical blocks or you know severe bone on bone it, it often fail those i you know consider surgical interventions and for me in my hands at this stage i'm really deciding between an ankle fusion and an ankle replacement um in in my hands, um, I am I lean a lot more to. Um, I think that in, in him, for example, uh, he has minimal minimal deformity. He still has about 20, 25 degrees of motion, and I think even with that anterior impingement, I believe you know if I need a gastroc or TAL, a dorsiflexion back with an ankle replacement. I think a fusion is a is a very reasonable option in this individual as well. Um, they're 66, they're active. Um, and so uh, for me, when I'm considering what to do, I kind of take both their picture in the sense of their degree of deformity, arthritis, their motion, but also what they do in life, um, their activity, and then and then have a discussion with them about and I give them both options and what they want to do. That sounds really thorough. 
referral. Um, Dr. Kelly, what are you doing in this case? I think we heard Dr. Gonzalez's kind of his, his treatment algorithm plan and maybe his bias here. Would you fuse, would you replace anything different? So actually, um, yeah, I think, you know, I, I have to agree with Dr. Gonzalez. I think that, you know, it, it really kind of comes down to two main options here. It's either fusion or an ankle arthroplasty. And um, based on kind of the patients, not only their, their actual age, but kind of their, their physiological age, uh, being in, in New York City, I swear I've never seen healthier 75-year-olds in my life. Um, who are actively surfing and doing all sorts of crazy activities. Um, but I do have that conversation since there can be some more uh, activity limitations with an ankle replacement uh, to a certain degree. Uh, and that would be a conversation I had with them. But this would, would be a great candidate for a total ankle, um, given the, the minimal deformity um, and uh, and activity level for them. And I think this is what you chose uh, in the end, Dr. Gonzalez, and, and the, these are the films, it looks like, at some time point post-operative, how did the patient do? Uh, he did great. I mean, he got back to about, you know, about five degrees of dorsiflexion, um, no more walking kind of on his tippy toes. I did do a TAL in him as well. So, one thing with these and then minimal pain you know he's uh he did great so I, I think this was the right decision in him um i think one thing in these cases so he, th these are a lot tougher than they look and, and i think as you do more of these so when you get in that ankle when you see these ones that are really bone on bone they're partially auto fused so his talus mm -hmm. was fused to his fibula and his and the back of his old posterior malfracture was fused. So it ends up being a lot more work than your simple cuts. And you have to do pretty extensive gutter debridements um, and to get the ankle replacement in. So I think when we, when we assess these post-traumatic cases, um, I always get a CT scan. I mean, I get one for uh, often I'm doing some type of patient specific implant, but I get one anyways to look for these auto fusions or things that I may need to take down because those can make the implantation of the ankle a lot. The, the pre-op planning. Additionally in him, I had to take out that screw to fit the ankle replacement. Um, but because I, you know, you take out that uh, screw and it leaves a fairly sizable hole, I always put something back in um, at the actually the same time because I, I want to make sure I take it out and then put a smaller one in before I do the rest of my ankle because uh, I, I worry about that acting as a stress riser so um, uh, and, and potentially fracturing during the case. So I just take away my concerns at the very beginning of the case. But And uh, I mean, obviously, I think time will tell, but so far, so good. I think that's a great first case to start off with, and I think we're going to elevate the level of complexity as we go here. So let's go to the next case. This is from Dr. Kelly. Why don't you go ahead and tell us about this one? Sure. So uh, so this is a, a lovely 55-year-old woman who also had a history of uh, right ankle injury that occurred in 1999. Uh, so by the time she saw me, she was about 24 years out. Um, she did have, you know, a little bit of things on her medical history that might have raised my spidey sense, um, as I call it. So she did have a history of substance abuse, but it had been 18 years sober. Uh, she did have a history of depression and, uh, and ADHD. Um, she, from a surgical standpoint, she did have a gastric bypass uh, history and a history of cholecystectomy. Um, but overall, uh, you know, she had been doing well. Her biggest issue was her ankle. Um, and one thing I, I didn't mention in this is one of her favorite things to do was uh, was to snorkel. Uh, she loved going to the beach. She loved going snorkeling, and she liked doing like long fin snorkeling and diving, which was just becoming completely impossible with uh, with her ankle. And so on physical exam, you know, her BMI was thirty eight. Um, it, you know, overall she had a stiff ankle range of motion and it was quite painful and swelling. 
She had no pain with subtalar range of motion. She did have good capillary refill, um, but she did have this subjective neuropathy uh, that occurred uh, after she had her initial, she, after she had a COVID infection a couple years prior. Um, and this was one of the things that I took into account when I was considering uh, what her treatment was going to be. Uh, she had already done um, bracing, injections, um, and of course, PT uh, as well. And then these were her x-rays. She also had, you know, that bone on bone. We had a, a high fibula ORIF that was done uh, previously. And then these are just the views from her CT scan. Uh, like Dr. Gonzalez, I also get CT scans. Um, sometimes that can also influence my decision making. If I think that somebody might be um, amenable to an ankle arthroplasty, um, I want to make sure that, you know, I want to check the bone stock. I also do patient specific instrumentation as well. Um, so for, for this case, you know, I, I talked to the patient about her options. Um, we kind of came to, um, but yeah, actually, I don't want to give it away. <laughs> Sorry, we'll save that for a second here. No, <laughs> um, Dr. Gonzalez, what are you thinking here? Are you thinking fusion, replacing, maybe something, you know, off the shelf, thinking like distraction arthroplasty or something else, given the fact that she sounds like she's 55, a smoke or non-smoker, but 55, maybe some neuropathy and some substance abuse history in the past. What are some things you're considering here in making your decision making or kind of weighing your options? Well, I am definitely. <laughs> I think we missed uh, what you just said, or at least I did. It might've cut out. I said, I'm definitely not doing a distraction arthroplasty. <laughs> uh, uh, Megan, I would ask for her neuropathy, is that more, does she still have protective sensation intact and, and full motor function? So she had full motor function. Um, her, her sensory neuropathy, protective sensation was generally intact. Um, it, was, it, was kind of, it had a very odd distribution. Um, I've found a fair amount of this in, in some folks that have had a relatively recent, like less than a year uh, COVID infection. I saw her in 20, actually I saw her in 2020. So it was like, you know, late 2020 um, in New York where, you know, about 95% of people have had it at that point. Um, and I was finding a lot of random symptoms, uh, musculoskeletal symptoms that had started after these COVID infections. So there was no specific distribution to it. Uh, there wasn't any concern for like nerve compression proximally. Um, she just had this kind of odd, odd sensations throughout her foot that had been kind of ongoing. Yeah, no, and I, I think it's an important point because we always say neuropathy is a contraindication, mm -hmm. but I think neuropathy is a very broad diagnosis and and i see patients all the time with neuropathy is intact and their motors intact we're really worried about loss of motor or potential uh neuropathy without protective sensation and sharp coat and if we're considering an ankle replacement mm -hmm. and so um i i really try to differentiate that and uh if i need an emg nerve control help me rule out any because some people say they have it and their nerve study is completely normal um yeah. and so that helps me differentiate that because i do believe if they have loss of protective sensation or any type of um motor impairment they're not getting an ankle replacement in, in at least in my hands no um, me neither. in terms of her the long fin uh so in her the her neuropathy wouldn't dissuade me from an ankle replacement uh, mm -hmm. in her uh, the long fin diving, I mean, I think with a mobile bearing ankle replacement, I'd be very worried about that as it could spit out. I, I honestly don't worry much about that as with a fixed bearing um, implant. Um, I think you can put a little more stress on it. I think with an ankle replacement, you can do fine, but you can't, or an ankle fusion, but you're, when you, when you, Often you're 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 severely plantar flexing and you're using that ankle torque to to kind of generate momentum. So I would have some concerns about an ankle fusion in her as well. 
I think I'd have a discussion with her about what she wants to do. She's been sober for 18 years. So I think her, uh, she's, she's shown theoretically that she's done well. So I think I would consider an ankle replacement or an ankle fusion. I think even 55, I'd still consider, I just tell her that she, there's a good chance she'll need another one in her lifetime, but she's 55. She's young. I'd like to give her, um, uh, Good range of motion and mobility, but I'd have a discussion with her again. Risk and benefits of ankle fusion and ankle replacement in her and decide what you do. I think both would be good options um, uh, in her personally. Why don't you um, tell us, Dr. Kelly, what you ultimately decided with the patient in this case and what so, factors led you to decide that? So with this case, um, you know, we did, that's, ex that's actually exactly the conversation I had with her. We, we talked a bit about that. Uh, we talked about the possibility of her needing a, a a second surgery in the future if she if you know if we were to do an ankle replacement. Um, we so we ultimately went forward with um, we ultimately went forward with the fusion, um, and and she actually did like unbelievably fantastic. I mean, she was she was a great patient. Uh, even though my spidey sense was a little worried, I have to admit, um, about how things were going to go post-operatively. Uh, she actually went snorkeling uh, four months post-op. Uh, she went to the beach for the first time and went snorkeling for the first time four months post-op. I think because she had had so much limited ankle tibio tailor motion for so many years, that she already had had increased tarsal range of motion that allowed her to do it uh, without significant pain. Um, and these pictures of, of her about six months out, where she she had a great she had a great result from it. Um, I did choose for her to do like an anterior approach for uh, her ankle fusion for the possibility that if you know down the road, I like to spare the fibula, especially in these young folks. Um, so that if they do decide down the road that they would like to do um, an ankle replacement, that's still an option for them. Um, so when I when I am considering fusion as an option for patients, I do like to um, I, do, I do like to try to spare the fibula unless I'm pretty convinced that they will never ever ever get a total ankle. That sounds great. Looks like the fusion took really well. Um, all right. Let's keep moving to um, case number three. So actually, this is my case. Um, so this is a 61-year-old female. Um, these injury films are from 2020. So she had fallen um, three days post-op from having a breast reconstruction surgery for breast cancer um, and had had a, um, a deep um, flat by plastics to cover um, otherwise, medical history outside of being actively treated for breast cancer and mastectomy and coverage, um, depression, anxiety, and hypertension. Um, this occurred three days post-op from uh, her last surgery. Um, and injury films in the ER, she had a trimal fracture dislocation um, mm -hmm. that got reduced and was well reduced. Um, plans going forward, um, Dr. Gonzalez, would you treat this closed or would you uh, go towards operative management here immediately. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I obviously, I, I think this is an in, very unstable trimalleolar ankle fracture dislocation. Splint it, reduce it. Um, CT. I always get a CT scan on all my trimals, and then uh, fix it once swelling resolves. Perfect. Um, I think that sounds sound, and in this case. Um, she got a CT, it was well reduced, but obviously unstable, but did not want operative treatment, had just been through a very, very big procedure, um, had some complications and was very adamant she did not want surgical management. This was before I met her. Um, I uh, inherited her about two years after this, um, but did not want treatment. So um, I'm assuming both of you, if that was the case, cast, um, so she got casted. Um, this was um, four weeks after she got discharged from the hospital um, and probably about more like six or seven weeks out from the injury. Okay, Dr. Kelly, um, 
what are you going to do now? Are you going to, you know, what are you going to talk to the patient about? Are you going to try to convince her to go back? Or what would you be thinking here? You're, we're maybe about six or seven weeks out from the, the injury. I, I would probably have a pretty frank discussion. I'm, 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 I'm worried that she's tilting as, you know, she's tilting so much that if that were to continue to go, you're going to be staring at her medial malleolus or, you know, the remainder of her medial malleolus through the skin. Um, not too far. I actually had a patient with a similar issue, but with a little bit uh, more extensive of a backstory. She had rheumatoid and had gotten fixed. Um, and that just kind of fell. She got an infection that fell apart. They treated her in an X fix um, only. And that she started to look like this, but had zero pain. And um, I did have a hard time trying to conv I, I I said, look, you know, if you're feeling okay, she was she was in her 80s. Um, and she's like, look, I'm not having any pain. I can walk fine. I feel great. Um, knowing that her treatment would have been, um, uh, I would have had to like fuse her um, over a reconstruction. And we ultimately ended up going to surgery when she was tilting so far over that the skin medially was, was starting to break down. Um, but I tried to hold off as long as we could. With sure. this one being a month out, you know, you could potentially revise it. Um, you know, I just, I, I don't know how good the outcomes would be, but that would be a conversation to have if she was willing to try and do it and maintain some motion. But, oh, but I yeah. know it's not, it's, yeah, it's not ideal. Oh, good. Yeah. She won't let you do it. She won't let you do it. She doesn't want anything. She's still really, really um, averse to surgery after everything she's been through. So now she's presenting to my clinic. Um, this is now um, close to two years out. Um, what do you, what are you thinking now? Now she's a lot more open to the idea of surgery. Dr. Gonzalez, she is in so much pain. She has trouble with ambulation. She really just wants to be able to walk with, with some comfort. Um, what are your thoughts now um, about surgical planning? Because she is up for it now. Do you want any other imaging? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, she's got a clear, severe valgus malunion, right? I mean, uh, end stage arthritis in the ankle. Uh, for me, I get, so in, in this case, um, which like I like you, I have for some reason I have more of these than I probably should. Um, what I would do is I get a CT scan um, because my, right now I'm thinking of a subtalar fusion or sorry an ankle isolated ankle or a TTC. I hate TTCs, so if I don't have to do them, I won't. Does she have any subtalar pain? Is all in her ankle? You know what? It's hard to decipher because she is in. She's got so much deformity. Her whole kind of hind foot area hurts. So I, I probably say yes. Um, it all hurts. That's kind of what she's saying. It all, it so all hurts. It, in this case, I mean, really, I probably would. What I would probably do at looking at this CT, I may get an MRI to look at her subtalar joint. I would do an osteotomy. I would take out her fibula, um, osteotomize the medial mal because it's all healed and stiff. And then go in and then um, I would do an ankle fusion on her. I wouldn't do a TTC. Um, I'd see how she does because, um, and I would correct the deformity, you know, go medial, go lateral. And then um, usually you can correct these. If I then needed a calcaneal osteotomy for any reason to correct any residual valgus, you could add that in. Um, and then I'd see how she does. I feel most of the time in these malunions, their subtalar joints are fairly spared. Um, because they're non-traumatic, um, uh, but then uh, again, if if uh, it pres I would I would in my hands I'd get an MRI to confirm that, but I'd probably just I would do the ankle and correct the deformity. I'd osteotomize tibia, fibula, and then do any osteotomy through the joint, and then do an ankle fusion. And you're gonna have to do medial soft soft tissue releases, or sorry, lateral soft tissue releases, probably some perine perineals z lengthenings tals all that kind of good stuff because she's been so contracted laterally and then you're going to have and i take out the fibula for sure because that'll help you with your wound laterally because you're 
bring her way over so your skin's going to be a little tough to close on that side. Dr. Kelly, um, any role, would, what do you think about his, uh, Dr. Gonzalez's approach going medial lateral versus considering maybe direct anterior? Um, and would you add the subtalar joint? So sorry, two part questions. What do you think about going direct anterior instead um, and uh, maybe um, adding or not adding subtalar? So I, I, I worry that in this case, going direct anterior, um, I don't know if I'd be able to um, get enough access to both sides um, in order to correct the deformity. If I've kind of made the decision that the fibula is going to be sacrificed uh, anyway, especially to either both to provide bone graft, but to also help uh, correct the deformity, um, I'm going to have to take the fibula out anyway, and getting to it from an anterior approach uh, is is going to be too much uh, tension on the skin. Um, so in in this case, I would consider doing like a, a lateral and medial uh, incision to just get a better uh, view of both sides um, to to attack uh, both both ends of the deformity. Because I think even if you were to get one of the sides out, if you were to take out the fibula, you're still not going to be able to move that over until you address the medial mal malunion. Um, as far as the subtalar joint, uh, I think it would kind of depend on how she feels in my hands too. Um, if I did have the concern. Now, I guess my other question for you is how how is her functional status as far as uh, ambulation, um, you know, it, it, like her physiological age, because some of these older folks, the TTC now, I like just because I feel more comfortable with them weight bearing if I don't if I don't trust their ability to stay off of it. So, um, great questions. Um, physiologically, so I think she's she's sixty one and really is okay. about sixty one. Um, yeah. uh, as far as functionality. You know, it's been two years. Um, she's just recovered um, from breast cancer and she um, really doesn't do a whole lot of activity. She's really just looking to walk without mm -hmm. discomfort, significant discomfort. So yeah, so, I, think, I, I think in that case, like, you know, I think consider, I, I would consider a TTC now. I think it's kind of dealer's choice um, because sometimes, I, to be honest, I don't love putting in TTC nails either. Um, but for someone like this, um, with this degree of deformity and someone who just wants to walk again and is not looking to like run the New York City Marathon, um, you know, that that may be something to get her on her feet again uh, faster um, and and give her just more reliable function. But but I think it's a little I think it's a little dealer's choice at that point. Perfect. So I, you know, I think everything you guys both alluded to are all some things I considered here. And it was a pretty tough decision for me. I ultimately voted not to go direct anterior for essentially the reasons that you both mentioned. Mainly my worry was that that shelf of bone on the fibula and, and the, um, you can only, I tried to show two cuts here and some of the cuts that I um, had um, hoped to show is that it's partially healed. And I felt like I was going to need to do an osteotomy through that and also take the fibula. I felt like my best chance at getting this where I wanted um, direct lateral and direct. Oh, did we lose our Oops. moderator? <laughs> Potentially. You are live, guys. Still. Um, so, so I guess we. I can kind of. Let's see. Is she getting back? No. Nope. Well, I guess. Made that glitch if you guys want to keep going. Yeah, we can. Um, so we can kind of show. I think we kind of talked about what the options were. So what she ended up doing. Let me take control here. There we go. Uh, so, so it looks like she did a little bit of a combo. Um, oh, there we go. I think she's back. No. 
Okay. Um, there she is. Sorry, it froze. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, perfect. Yep. Okay. Where, where did, I'm not sure what you guys heard or or didn't hear before I realized it had frozen. Um, so I elected to do a TTC um, lateral direct lateral direct medial add the subtalar joint through that. I end up using a straddle plate. Um, you know what? In hindsight, so these are images that are probably six months post op. Um, but I. <laughs> the interesting thing here is she came in walking at two weeks and needed a splint change before and got put into a cast and needed two cast changes because she was uh, walking from basically two, two to three weeks um, and never stopped um, despite um, my desires. So we really walked um, basically before stitches came out on her. So I think if even if I had gone away with the direct anterior, I might have gotten in trouble from a soft tissue standpoint. Um, and I, I think maybe the straddle, the, the plate, um, which, you know, I've changed my configuration since then doing this to straddle both sides, but, um, I think it might've saved me here. Um, she's a year and a bit out now. Um, and I don't think she's doing awesome, but she's doing okay. And she's, she's walking, she's neutral and, uh, she doesn't use aids, um, except for long distances. So I call it, a you know, a soft tissue in more than anything based on, um, how non-compliant we really were during the post-op period. Um, questions. So I'll, I'll ask a question. Why, yeah. why the plate and the nail? Do you know, that is, um, uh, you know, credit to someone I, I spoke to before who had kind of seen enough of these fail or had given me some advice. And this is the first combo I had done with a plate, um, in these cases, I've often just gone straight to a TTC and not mm -hmm. used the plate. Um, this was actually the first one I added it. And um, in hindsight, I think it might've saved me because um, I, I think I might've had a, a pretty big failure without it. Um, but yeah, I think either is fine. Yeah. No, it's great. Um, so, uh, okay. Good, let's keep moving. Um, so we're gonna keep moving forward. This was with um, Dr. Kelly, tell us about this case here. All right, so this is a, a lovely 74 year old gentleman. Um, he had a history of, a, I also inherited him, uh, had a history of calcaneus fracture, but back in his twenties, um, it was treated conservatively at the time. Um, overall, he had been doing well since then. He had some mild cavus in his hind foot, very stiff and painful subtalar range of motion. Uh, he was he did not have any neuropathy, intact protective sensation, but he was really just tender along the sinus tarsi. Um, we had tried some bracing. Uh, we did try some injections. We tried some uh, physical therapy to work on, you know, the perineal uh, tendon strengthening. Um, but really, his big issue was was really isolated at a subtalar joint. Um, so you can see here we have uh, images. He really didn't have a lot of collapse with his um, with his calcaneus fracture, and he actually had good dorsiflexion. So, um, so one of the things that, of course, with with a history of a calc fracture, I wanted to make sure is that his uh, subtalar joint or his ankle joint was had decent range of motion uh, to determine whether, you know, there was a uh, distraction needed as well. Um, so I had the conversation with him. Um, he was he was still working um, at the time, and this was getting to the point where he did a lot of, he spent a lot of time on his feet with work. He worked in the TV industry and said, you know, look, I'm just gonna have to retire. Um, I'm planning on retiring at the end of the season. And, you know, I think it's time to do something about it. Um, and, and sure enough, you know, I, I thought that was reasonable. So, um, so really we, you know, this was a little more straightforward than some of the other ones, but, but as far as, uh, for sub Taylor fusions, uh, for you guys, what, uh, what are your thoughts, configurations, um, all of that? Cause this one, this one was kind of pretty straightforward to me, but I didn't have a ton of, uh, post-traumatic ones myself. Yeah, I mean, these are, I mean, I mean, you know, it's tricky because his, his talus is so flat. You think, and mm -hmm. he has those anterior osteophytes, you think he would impinge and have some ankle pain. And then when you do a subtalar fusion, they 
they flatten more and the tail is dorsiflexed more. So sometimes I find it hard for these to decide when to do a, a you know, a bone block distraction arthrodesis. Um, mm -hmm. um, in, in general, you know, I agree if he has great dorsiflexion and no ankle pain, don't fix what's not broken. Mm -hmm. um, so I agree with you 100% on that, Megan. Um, a lot of times if, if I'm not doing in like a post-traumatic like this um, and doing just a um, isolated sub fusion, I'll do an L all MIS um, with a burr, uh, sometimes arthroscopically assisted and then uh, two screws. Um, if I'm doing a sub fusion with a, um, a type of, of triple, then I, I, I do a different configuration. But see, that looks great, but it looks like his tail is dorsiflexed more. How's his right. ankle range of motion after this? Fine, right? He, I swear, it's I had fine, to, right? I had to like calm him down. I was like, all right, I don't want you going to the gym yet. We can't go to the gym yet. Yeah, he's probably um, fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, he did. He was amazing. Like, I, I was shocked. Um, just because he, you know, he felt great. He had no pain after surgery considered going back to work i'm like all right well um but yeah I, I mean he did really well and again that ankle like he has no ankle pain um i had to refer him to one of my partners because now his hips bothering him uh but but it really and i think a lot of it really came down to the fact that he was his tenderness was just so isolated over his sinus tarsi and that was really it um, and, and like you mentioned that, you know, these can be tough because you want to make sure you're not going to cause another problem. Um, I did not do, um, at this point I wasn't doing any MIS stuff yet. So, um, but this probably would have been actually a great case to do MIS. Um, you know, knowing now what I know, um, if I knew now or then what I know now, I would have probably considered that for this case. It would have been a nice one for it. I'm so impressed. So are you guys doing some of your subtalar arthrodesis is um, all the, some of the prep work with MIS technique? Yeah. So I'll do, I'll do um, it all MIS. So I'll make a posterior lateral portal on it and, and I'm not arthroscopic. It's with, with, a, with a burr mm -hmm. um, under fluoroscopic guidance and, and I'll do it for subtalar fusions, triple arthrodesis, ankle fusions, MTP fusions. I'll do it all MIS and then percutaneous fixation. And if I want to add bone graft, I'll do extend the portal and use a little cannula to, to put in bone graft. I am, I am, I've not quite gotten that um, extensive with my MIS uh, treatment yet, um, but I am starting to do more uh, from a bone prep standpoint. Um, I'm still in bunion stage. Um, bunion and hammer toe stage, which have has been quite transformative anyway. Um, but, but this is kind of like my next, next frontier is doing it for more, um, more of these. Um, uh, I found that I do a lot more forefoot than I do a hind foot, uh, given that patients. So do you change, uh, Tyler, do you change your, your post-op protocol if you're doing these MIS or are you still keeping them off of it for six weeks? I still keep them off six weeks. Yeah. I do. It's just, I mean, again, it, it's. I think you just create a very nice, and you can't do everybody MIS, right? It's not a panacea. It's a panacea. It depends on the deformity, right? How bad their deformity is, how much bone stock they have. Um, so you got to choose the right patients. And, and I think you're doing the right thing, Megan. You got to start somewhere. I started with chylectomies and then went to DMMOs and then went to the calc and then went to the bunion and then went to the Zadix and then went to the fusions. And so um, it's kind of just a, an evolution of your comfort level. But I, I think that um, they, I don't change my weight bearing protocol. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I keep that the same, but I just find my, my, their swelling, their soft tissue envelope is much lower wound complications, much lower pain because you do so much less stripping. And then you create a really nice environment for healing, in my opinions. Okay. But they're tricky. So you have to do it's it's not a slam dunk, right? It, it takes there's a learning curve to it. And you got to do it right. You can't just stick it in there. And uh, otherwise, you're going to get a non unions, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, for for me, I you know, the reason I think that my MIS stuff started more with the forefoot is almost more of a practical nature. Um, living in Manhattan, um, a lot of my patients, the idea of just doing a surgery where you have to take them off their feet for six weeks um, is is not ideal when they live in a fourth floor walk up in Brooklyn. Uh, so, so my practice tends to be a little bit more on the forefoot, uh, side for that reason. Um, but, but yeah, but this guy obviously, you know, did, did great. So. He loves awesome. It. Oops. Uh, do you guys know what it means when it says push to audience? Sure. I'm going to see if I can go back or, or can you see the slides move? Nope. You're not seeing it move. It says it doesn't give me control now to move to the next one. It says to push to audience instead of yeah, going to the next one. Control button. Okay. There we go. Oh, All right. Hey. Okay. I I I think we have 20 minutes left. Uh we've got eight cases here as as to make sure we kind of um brought some of the the interesting cases forward. I, I'm gonna skip through this one. Um, also because um, Sarah's not here and uh, I'm going to keep moving. There's two cases I want to cap off with. One of them, um, actually, we'll do this one. And then Tyler, I know you have a case. The last case we included is pretty interesting. Um, so I wanted to cover two two more cases. So this is case six. Um, so case six, this, this gentleman is 44 years old. Um, he had an injury in 21 um, and presented to the ER about three months later. Um, I don't I don't think the original films are included here, um, but it was certainly a Liz Frank um, that was unstable. Um, and that was about two years ago when I met him um, and indicated him for surgery and he disappeared completely um, and showed back up on my OR schedule two years later with these x-rays. Um, uh, and I brought him back into clinic. Um, so uh, his past medical history, so he's 44 and he's healthy. That's what he says. Um, he had a cervical spine injury that was taken care of the two years prior, um, but otherwise nothing endorsed. Um, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with that and then le let you guys start asking some questions and I'll start pulling through some slides. What's his A1C? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, he's um. So I took it because I I he was neuropathic to me until I could prove otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. he he's not diabetic and he, his A1C is normal, not yeah. diabetic at all. Any um, any any his I mean I mean uh, when you first saw him, it wasn't open, no evidence of any infection. No, and that was about three and a half months after the injury. Um, and I did a monofilament test because there, you know, I think Sarah didn't include the films um, from the first one, but um, it was really clear that even those images looked funny to me. Um, and, and so yeah. I did a monofilament test. I looked back through my notes actually for this case, and I said that he passed the monofilament test, but I had high suspicions of developing neuropathy. Um, so uh, I mean, this is one where you just, I don't know what's, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kelly. No, go, go ahead. ahead please. Um, yeah, go ahead. No, I was, I was just going to say it's weird, right? It doesn't yeah. look normal. You're thinking, okay, well, my, I'm like, is this Charcot? Is this infectious? This does not look like a typical non-union of a Liz Frank, right? Like there's literally erosion of the TMT joint, the, the two, three, four metatarsals or sublux, but the bone just looks abnormal. He's got midfoot collapse, dorsal subluxation, fragmentation. I mean, it's screaming some, some Charcot process um, or infectious process. So when I get these, I, I just do the full work. If I set all the blood work, I send the A1C, the vitamin D, ESR, CRP. I scan normal. them. I usually get, you know, I'll get a, all, all normal. So if, if Everything's normal. MRI is normal. CT scan is normal. Uh, the scans are not normal. The labs are normal. The <laughs> labs are normal for A1C, oh, ESR, oh. CRP. CT scan is um, not included, but I got a CT scan. And just as you said, it's it's, it's Charcot. It's essentially Charcot. He's mm -hmm. essentially a neuropathic patient. Uh, idiopathic neuropathy, first, second, and third are sublux with midfoot collapse. Um, yes. No, those are not normal, but the labs are normal. 
when you said he had a cervical spine yeah, injury yeah. when this originally happened, any residual yeah. stuff from like what, how bad was his cervical spine injury? Two, three, five, and six with a vertebral artery injury. And that was followed. No sequelae from, from what he's saying. Yeah. A really great questions. Okay. So presumably everyone agrees this guy has, it's not infectious, it's Charcot or some type of neuropathic process. I think we have a question maybe. Um, and, uh, he wants to have surgery. He's a non-smoker. Uh, let's start there. Uh, thoughts on um, what you're gonna do, what what your what your construct's gonna be. Strong. <laughs> um, but, I mean, you as you mentioned, like this is kind of a charco unless proven otherwise. So I would, you know, that's kind of how I would treat it. Um, so I think that, you know, making sure that you have good, strong fixation um, into, into the bones. I think there's, there's some options you can do here. Um, I have to admit in my hands, I've not had good luck with the, the bolts. Um, partially because I think some of the ones that I've tried to do the bolts with have had so much deformity in the forefoot that I couldn't get that shot from the the first MTP joint into the into the medial talus. Um, however, this one actually might be very amenable to it. Um, I don't know, you know, I think this is also one that I would consider, um, you know, prepping the joints with an MIS fashion, because if you're concerned for um, shark ho and you're concerned for wound healing, um, that is also, you know, only gonna help you um, by having a smaller incision. I don't know. What do you think, Tyler? Yeah. So these are, these are hard. So yeah. he's got two deformities, right? So he's going to need a biplanar osteotomy. And I agree with you. It, that is going to be his first ray is above his, almost above his navicular. So it's going to be tough shot with the beams, but, but um, uh, I, so I think he needs a biplanar osteotomy. This again, how you do it. I do that MIS too. I'll do, so I have a big shark. I mean, not, I am in South Carolina, so I take care of a lot of shark hose. So my, my hind foot reconstructions are usually MIS and I'm, as are my midfoot. Um, so I would do a biplanar osteotomy to correct the midfoot. You're likely, you're definitely going to have to include the NC joint mm -hmm. um, and, and probably the TN and the subtalar joint as well, just from a stability construct. Um, and then because I'm doing MIS, and if I can correct the deformity, then I usually do a medial column nail uh, into the talus. I'll fuse a subtalar joint, and then I'll usually I'll beam him in probably two, three, and he may need something in the lateral column. I we have to see what the CT scan shows. But however, with the caveat being, because uh, you're definitely um, there's definitely that inability, Megan, you're right, to not get that shot up the medial yep. column. And then I would just open it and do a medial column plate. But but I, I've but but it but I, my 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 go-to would be biplanar MIS osteotomy, correct the deformity, and then and then beam and bolt them and, and I'd lock down his subtalar and TN as well. All right. He's getting uh, the full Monty. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Right. Um, so in this case, um, you know, presumably all the things we talked about. So I worked him up fully. Um, I presumed it to be neuropathic and charco. Um, I I am not as facile with MIS here. I definitely had to do this open. Um, definitely um, biplanar um, osteotomies and correction here with the plan and the intention to do. Uh, I'll keep going here. Um, first, uh, beaming and bolting, um, first, um, I ended up putting one in the second. I could not get one in the third. Um, I did a subtalar fusion and then I ended up stabilizing the lateral column just because I felt like, um, I really needed a tripod effect here, um, to add some stability. Um, I would criticize, um, my reduction fully. I think Sarah, uh, probably got overloaded with all the films I sent her, um, fluoroscopically, um, you know, this was as good as the reduction was getting both uh, in the chronal and sagittal plane for it me on that great. day. I, yeah, uh, I know. It looks great. Uh, <laughs> thanks. I really yeah, uh, didn't feel like I could really reconstitute Mary's any better. Um, pretty exhausting case. Um, but I, uh, yeah, uh, 
That's what I did. <laughs> and he is walking all over That's it. Right. Um, and he is not six weeks of yet. Of course he is. Um, this is his third cast change, unfortunately. Um, he's in a boot now because he's getting friction burns on the cast from ambulating. Um, so I just saw him for um, five weeks, so I don't have an x-ray yet uh, because that's the situation we're in, unfortunately. But yes, uh, comments or questions at all. Um, no, I mean, I think I think this looks great. I mean, I think I think the one thing, I mean, I've, I've tried to do this construct and, and her... Uh, the woman I had her her deformity was just so bad I couldn't get the shot and I had to bail to a to a medial column plate, and she ultimately healed medially, but I don't think I did enough um, of a tripod on the lateral side, and she ended up collapsing through her lateral foot. So I think that your point of making sure that you have some kind of a tripod um, and and good support on the lateral side too is important uh, to remember so that. You know, you don't want the medial side to do okay and then the lateral side to just collapse out, out around it. Yeah, I think on these cases with this much deformity, yeah. you, you, oh, sorry. Yeah, you, you, you pretty much, you really need the subtalar uh, mm -hmm. joint with you and you really need the lateral column stability, um, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, I think we have nine I, minutes. I agree with both of you. Um, I think we Is have that, time. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tyler. Go ahead. No, I, I, I think you presented a great case. It's Those are really hard cases. I mm -hmm. I think you did a beautiful job. I, I agree. I, I think in, I'm usually a less is more type of surgeon, but not in Charcot. I'm a, yeah. I'm a more is more. And I, I think that, um, as I said, I think you have to lock down the medial column. You need the subtalar. You need to lock down the TN joint. The only thing I'll say which is hard to do, but if you can do it, and I know this because it, those two, th that second bolt, I also, I try to get that as far as I can in, right? I try to get that into the talus also, if I can. Um, and then same for the third, if I can. I think you did, you, you I mean, you, you did the best you could with what you were dealt and it looks great. They're just always such hard cases um, to do. And if you can get a, your bolt, or the beam from the calc, I'll sometimes try to get it in the fourth or the fifth. I'll try to span the whole lateral column um, as well, just because I try to get whatever I can because they always walk on it right away. So, but great case, really nice. Um, uh, let us, next year you can show us the revision when, because he's going to break everything. <laughs> oh, so frustrating. <laughs> um, so frustrating. In <laughs> Iowa, so... <laughs> Yeah, um, okay. be fine. I, I think we have, I really think we probably have five minutes. So um, just because I want to be able to get the next um, group going on time. So can I can actually, sorry guys, can I actually ask some of the questions that are being asked here? Oh yes. Yes. By the crowd. Sure. So well, the first one is it was mentioned that during an ankle arthrodesis with a fibula takedown um, and not doing, so doing an ankle arthrodesis with a fibula takedown and not doing a TTC arthrodesis. So I guess they're, what they're trying to ask is when you're doing a TTC and if you are taking down the fibula, do you later notice instability of the subtalar joint and do you find that to be a problem? Yeah, I sorry, think, Selena, I, I responded. I guess I responded just to him, that person. Um, I do a lot of um, uh, ankle fusions through a lateral approach where I take out the fibula. Um, I have not found subtalar instability in those patients. I mean, presumably, right? Uh, it, it makes sense that that can happen. I mean, essentially, your your perineals aren't going to work very well anymore, and you you lose your lateral ligament complex. But I haven't seen that be, be an issue where I've had to convert those to um, um, any fusions or they've developed instability. And I think the literature has shown really long-term longevity with lateral approach ankle fusions, removing the fibula. So I think it's a great thought. I just haven't seen it in clinical practice. Awesome. And I think the other two are, were just comments. So you guys are going strong. Got four more minutes. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, four more minutes going strong. Okay, this is, you know, um, probably I'll get, how about one minute just to, to kind of present the case and then um, some quick questions. Tyler, this is your case. 
Oh yeah, so 80, 80, 81 year old male, 30 year history of ankle pain, his past medical history, he has GERD, peripheral vascular disease, coronary artery disease, peripheral neuropathy, which is idiopathic, hypertension, history of strokes. His physical exam, he has poor pulses. So anyone, anytime I can't get good pulses, I send them for ABIs if I'm considering surgery or presenting surgical cases. So I just jumped out. The ABIs were normal. If they're not normal, I'll send them the vascular surgery uh, for evaluation. He has a rigid ankle deformity with minimal motion, but a lot of pain. Um, he's otherwise neurovascular intact. So Here's his x-rays, um, AP lateral oblique views upright. You can see he has a, a record bottom, record bottom deformity of his tibia and his fibula, as well as significant um, uh, ankle arthritis. Like I said, he has minimal motion. So in this ankle, it barely moves. It's fairly auto-fused, but it still hurts. Um, and um, he walks. I mean, he, he walks on it. He gardens. He does his normal stuff um, at home. And the only thing, like as we all talk today, because we have mute, is he just wants to do what he does now without pain. Um, and he's failed everything. Bracing. Bracing doesn't do much because the ankle doesn't move anyways. But his braces didn't work. Injections, anti-inflammatories. He did those for about two years with me, and they kind of took the edge off. But now it's just too miserable. And he wants something done about it. Two questions, Tyler. Does he have does he have pulses? I'm not, you know, does he have a good pulse at all? And what was his ABI? His ABIs were normal. They were like about one. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we have let's just say two minutes left. Why don't you tell us what you did? So, so as like as you guys know, I'm a big fan of ankle replacement. I am not a fan of ankle replacement in in this guy. Um, uh, you know, I thought I, I taught him I could do a tibia and fibula osteotomy, correct that. I do not think you can correct that deformity through the ankle. I think he would need something in the tibia corrected and then have an ankle replacement. He didn't really want that. Um, and he already had such limited motion. So I just talked to him about doing a fusion. Um, and, uh, so I see here, I did a lateral approach, took out the fibula, um, I thought, you know, I did not do a tibial osteotomy because he was so anterior subluxed already, but he had no pain in his knee. He was not hyperextending. He had a fairly reasonable gait. So I was like, if I fist fuse him where he is, he'll probably do phenomenal. And that's exactly what happened. So I, I posteriorly translated him a little bit on his ankle, um, got that back on, better under the tibia underneath more of his mechanical than his anatomic axis. And um, yeah, he loves it. He's got no pain. He's back gardening, walking. Um, and with his, also why I wouldn't do an ankle replacement. He has neuropathy, peripheral vascular disease, terrible skin, but just for a point of discussion, but he was an ankle fusion candidate for me from the beginning, pretty much. Did you do him open or did you do him MIS or arthroscopically or? I did him open. So I did him open. I took out his fibula. He was he was open with with that amount of deformity um, that he had. I, I wanted to I, I I osteotomized the back of his tibia. Took some more of that posterior uh, aspect of his tibia out to really try to get his talus a little bit further back. So I did not do this MIS, and that's what we were talking about earlier. I don't think everyone's an MIS candidate, and I wanted to do him open. Awesome guys. What a fantastic uh, session. Great cases. You guys are uh, rising stars. Love it. Thank you guys for uh, making it through the night.